President Jones, thank you very much. I want to ask all of you to pray, pray for me because I spoke at another convention about three hours ago. And y'all helped me get through this because I need it. But I wouldn't have missed this opportunity for a number of reasons. First of all, let me say to you that President Jones and I are very dear friends. I consider him a visionary, and I'd like to tell you why I consider him that. You folks own a bank, and it's, I think there's two union-owned banks in the United States, and we've got to do something about some of the publicity that's been put out that folks own the other bank are saying they're the only bank that's owned by a union, and I know better than that. But President Jones's vision is that the labor movement should stop giving its pension money, stop giving its dues money, stop giving its investment money to those people on Wall Street who turn around and give it to the people who kill us. <clears throat> We're not the two biggest unions in the AFL-CIO, but I tell you what we are. We got more money than most unions in the AFL-CIO. So when we combine the financial resources of your union, the Muller Makers, and the United Mine Workers, that's a great start. And I want to report to you today, in case you don't already know it, that we were given voluntary recognition at your bank, the Brother of Bank and Trust. So now we represent the workers at your bank. And I suggest to you that we're a team We, we are a team that believes in the same things. As I watched your film in the back, it kind of dawned on me that our histories are running parallel to one another. Uh, I was saying to Warren in the back that when the steam engine went out and uh, many bullet makers lost their jobs, many, many hundreds of thousands of coal miners fell right behind them because we supplied the coal that fired those steam engines. So our history goes back over a hundred years. And today I stand here proudly uh, with your president and also your secretary treasurer uh, uh, with Pre secretary treasurer Creighton uh, he's a good friend of all of organized labor and my dear friend Warren Far Fairley he and I are kind of talk the same you know so if you can't understand what I'm saying he'll interpret for you later uh, and your international executive board you have some of the best leadership in the labor movement uh, these people uh, are visionaries along with your president, President Jones. These people are the blood of your blood and the flesh of your flesh and the soul of your soul. And I want you to join with me and thank your leadership for what they've done for not only you, but the entire labor movement. They have shown the way for all of us. Let's give your leadership a round of applause. Now, this morning I was speaking to some uh, workers from California, uh, public employees who've been getting their brains beaten out. Of course, I would suggest most of us have. And what I suggested to them was that we need to be as forceful in our beliefs as the other side is. And, you know, you've got one party and one group of people out there blaming everything on the labor movement, and particularly public employees. But when they get through with the public employees, they talk about all of us. And we depend on the Democrats to stand up for us. But it seems to me, and I hate to, to do this, because I've got some very dear friends that are both, you know, Democrats, and some do really fight for us. But if it's true, what the Bible says, which I happen to believe, that the meek we inherit the world and the earth, boy, heaven's going to be full of Democrats because they don't stand up and fight back for us like they ought to. They owe us a better deal than we're getting.
When we come here today as a union that's seen a lot of tragedy and a lot of death in the coal mines, and I want to thank this union of yours. Uh, the Sago explosion in 2006, and Aracoma and Darby all were in 06. Crandall Canyon was in 07, and then the terrible tragedy last year. Every time that one of these tragedies occurred, the Bullet Makers Union has reached out for us and asked if there was anything that we could do to make things better for you. Those were all non-union miners, most people know it. But in the coal fields, everybody knows somebody else, you know, or everybody else. Uh, three of the miners, or four of the miners, that were killed uh, last year. The youngest person there was Corey Davis, and Corey uh, cut my mother's grass for her, and he, he was doing a project for his class in uh, middle school he, on coal mining. He took a picture with me. Uh, his dad played Little League Baseball for me, played football uh, for me. Uh, his uncle, Timmy Davis, died right beside him. The Davis family lost three family members side by side and just like that because of an explosion should never happen. The owner of that company, or the CEO of that company, was Don Blankenship. Don Blankenship was the worst of the worst. He was anti-union, he was anti-environment, he was anti-health and safety, and he was a Tea Party member before there was a Tea Party. And if there was any justice in the world, the FBI or the U.S. Marshals would be going to his house this morning, handcuffing him and putting him in shackles and hauling him off to the penitentiary to stand trial for murder. But that's not the way it works in our society. Because the rich are getting by with everything. And the rich are getting all the benefits of our society. But you know, this problem didn't just start. I want to suggest to you this problem's been with us for about 30 years now. 30 years ago, a Republican president eliminated a union, and that union was PATCO. And the truth is, we excused ourselves. We said, well, they had that coming. Uh, they violated their contract. Uh, they knew what was going to happen to them. So they, we shouldn't feel uh, too bad for those PATCO workers. I submit to you that we should have stood up in solidarity and in unity with those PATCO workers and told Ronald Reagan, if you're going to fire one, you're going to fire everybody in this country. We should have locked the country up. We should have shut the country down, and we would not have seen the scabs and replacement workers and the backward steps that we've seen all across this country. Thank you. Now I'm going to get a little bit radical with you. <clears throat> oh, I'm, I'm serious about this. There is this debate ongoing about which way we're going in this country. And I, I want you to think with me for a moment about this debate. You've got the rich folks who've given money to rich folks to get elected to office. They got elected to the governor's mansion in Wisconsin. They got elected to the governor's mansion in Ohio. And every and the governor's mansion uh, up in New Jersey and Michigan. What's the first thing it did? See, every problem we've got in the United States of America is because of organized labor. If we just do away with those unions in the public sector, eliminate ASME, eliminate AFG, and eliminate every public sector union out there, cut the pensions, cut the health care, cut the wages, terminate the workers, we'll straighten the country out. That's what they're saying. Now, up in the federal level in Washington, there's this great debate going on about what we should do about our country and what direction uh, we should take in our country. And let me say something to you. When you hear either a Republican, who mostly are Republicans saying this, but Democrats say it sometimes too, everything's on the table. Well, I want you to know that's a damn lie. Everything's not on the table. Now I'm going to tell you what isn't on the table. The millionaire's money is not on the table. The billionaire's money is not on the table. The CEO's pay is not on the table. The corporation's money is not on the table. GE, the largest corporation in the world, paid zero taxes last year to the government. But I'm going to tell you what infuriates me. I have a 92-year-old mother still in good health. 
Now, she doesn't walk too well, but she can debate with you all day long if you want to. But her Social Security's on the table. Her Medicare is on the table. Now, I got a question for you. Who's going to stand up and speak out for my mother? I'm sick and tired of everybody saying, well, we got to cut a little bit of Social Security. Then the Republicans say, that's not enough. And then somebody's, okay, we'll cut a little more. We'll cut some out of Medicare. And then they say, well, that's not enough. Well, how about the poor people? Well, let's just cut the poor folks' benefits. The people who can least afford this, these are the people who've lost their jobs jobs, don't have a job, living on maybe not even having unemployment insurance. And the only thing they have is Medicaid. And people are saying, well, we can't ask a millionaire to pay anything. We won't do that. Where are the principles of the Democratic Party to say, wait a minute, Cecil Roberts' 92-year-old mother is just as important as that CEO that's running GE. And his mother and your mother and everybody's mother. And Dad, what about that?